Hi everyone, my name is Bela and this is Emily, and for our city we chose Reykjavik, which is the capital city of Iceland. So Reykjavik is home to a very, very small population of only 123,000 people, and this is expected to go to only 148,000 by the year 2050. Reykjavik also sits atop the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So if you're not familiar with your geology, it's basically a boundary that separates two oceanic plates, and this is also where magma oozes out. So Reykjavik takes advantage of its geologic position and uh, supplies 75% of its energy through geothermal and also hydropower sources. Um, groundwater is also abundant in Reykjavik. Um, around seven, uh, it has a huge, uh, sorry, it sits under, uh, beneath um, a bedrock aquifer and has high levels of precipitation. So, and we're expecting that these levels increase by the year 2050 because of climate change and uh, glacier melt. But aside from all these positive aspects, there are challenges that Reykjavik faces, especially in the transportation sector. Reykjavik has one of the highest car ownership rates, with about 0.7 cars per capita, and around three quarters of all trips are made by personal vehicles. Um, the government also finds it hard to invest in um, advanced forms of public transport infrastructure because of the low ridership that they're expecting. And also because um, uh, Reykjavik is just a cold city, people just don't want to be outside for long periods of time. Another challenge that Reykjavik face, faces is with regards to waste. 50% of waste is recycled and 50% is landfilled. But none of it is converted into energy. Um, and that's because the government believes that because it has all these renewable and abundant and cheap uh, energy sources that they don't really need, they don't really have an incentive in converting waste into energy. So in light of these challenges, our vision for 2050 is to create an active, dense, and economically prosperous city while still enhancing uh, Reykjavik sustainability. Our specific goals are to reduce the number of trips made by uh, private automobiles from 75 to 30 percent, um, and also to ensure economic prosperity by increasing urban density and creating more areas of commercialized centers and mixed-use buildings. And this is backed by Jane Jacobs' urban philosophy on um, more eyes on the streets to create a less car-dependent city. Our specific goal for greenhouse gas emissions is to aim for a 75 reduction uh, compared to 2007 base level. So we're going to start with land use first because it basically gives you an overview of uh, the major land use, land, uh, land use design aspects that we're implementing. Um, so the total area of Reykjavik is 275 kilometers squared, but only 18% is the actual built up urban and suburban land. The rest of it is either agricultural or natural lands like volcanoes and mountains. So our first objective is to establish urban boundaries. Um, so this is going to be around the already 18% built up uh, urban area. So this amounts to 50 kilometers squared land. Um, and this is to limit urban sprawl. So any new population growth will be housed within, this, um, within these boundaries. And the boundaries are outlined in blue. Um, this area is divided into 40% transportation, 30% uh, buildings, and 30% open green spaces. Um, our first objective is to maintain these proportions, and wherever we're building new uh, neighborhoods, we're going to lessen the transportation uh, percentage. We're planning on placing 50% of the expected population growth in 281 four-story buildings, um, and these are going to be placed in the reclaimed brownfields that are outlined in the black, and the remaining 40% will be housed in current low-density neighborhoods just to increase the urban density. Um, we also relocated the Reykjavik Airport, which is right here, and it was originally there. Um, just because it, is, it was currently situated in the vicinity of the downtown area, and we felt like this was a really waste of uh, prime real estate. And we relocated it to um, um, a, a right-of-way land that is currently reserved by the government um, to build a new highway corridor. But we justified that we don't really need a new highway corridor because we're implementing an LRT line that we outlined in blue. And we're also having um, a continuous green path for, that is difficult to see, but it's the outline of green. Um, it's for pedestrians and bike cyclists that connect all the major, um, uh, all the major green spaces within the city. So for our neighborhood, we decided to choose um, the new neighborhood that we're planning on creating um, after we relocated the Reykjavik Airport. Um, so in, so, uh, <coughs> So far, um, so the area that we create after we located is two kilometers squared, and for this new neighborhood, we're aiming a land cover of 20% transportation, 40% um, buildings, and 40% green space. And to achieve this, we're applying an oblong gridded street pattern that is currently um, we copied from Reykjavik's downtown area, which is pretty difficult to see, but it's over there. And we suppose that this is the most effective um, street pattern because it has it could it connects a continuous network of bike and walking paths, and also more access to green space. 
Um, we also introduced heated sidewalks and uh, bike lanes in this building, and these are passively heated by underground pipes from nearby buildings that relay warm water. And there's also a branch of the LRT uh, transit line that will be running through the center, connecting the downtown to the southern, shore, southern Atlantic shore. So with regards to buildings, Reykjavik has zero cooling degree days and 4,573 4, heating degree days. So heating really consumes about 60% of the total energy of buildings, followed by lighting and water heating. We want to ensure that we provide high degree of insulation and air tightness in existing uh, buildings during retrofits. Uh, in Reykjavik's case, floors and roofs built after 1990 are 30% more efficient at insulating heat because they use a vacuum insulated uh, pan uh, panels with an airtight envelope. Um, older buildings often have no insulation at all. So to upgrade these buildings to post-1990 standards will really reduce heat loss by a factor of two to four. With regards to mirror buildings, we want to incorporate more passive housing techniques, optimal for Reykjavik by utilizing uh, solar energy for heating, daylighting, and ventilation. And our software expert here, Emily, also did some wet screen modeling to determine that uh, specifically triple pane windows will be the most effective and they can reduce um, heat losses up to tenfold compared to single pane windows. And we'll save you around 20 gigajoules of, uh, of, of heat per year per housing unit. And the building rating system that we plan on implementing is Brienne that is most popular in Europe. Um, so one of the biggest challenges that Reykjavik faces is uh, in terms of sustainability is transportation. Um, so since the climate in Reykjavik is relatively cold um, and the current public transportation system consists mainly of buses, uh, most people rely on private vehicles for their transportation. Um, so this chart here shows the existing modal split for Reykjavik um, and compares it to our proposed modal split for 2050, as well as our proposed implementation uh, for each mode. <coughs> so our goal for transportation in Reykjavik was to reduce um, trips by private vehicles from 74% to 30%. Uh, and increase the number of trips made by buses and active transport. And we also wanted to uh, implement an LRT system to help move the modal split away from cars. So the first step to achieving this was to try to disincentivize the use of public vehicles. And we did this by uh, implementing a vehicle kilometers, vehicle kilometers travel tax of 6.2 cents per kilometer. Um, so this was based off a study from Washington, D.C. that uh, found that implementing uh, a tax of 6.2 cents a kilometer would decrease personal car traffic by 14%. So that's what we decided to do uh, in Reykjavik. So the next step in reducing car travel was uh, public transit. So this map shows our proposed LRT routes uh, along the main uh, corridors of the city in blue, as well as um, the current bus routes in purple and the proposed uh, new bus routes in red. Um, so the idea here was that the LRT would cover the main tra traffic corridors and the bus would go through the smaller neighborhoods. Um, so in order to get our, mo our goal modal splits for public transit, we used um, equations from the Getting to Carbon Neutral report, um, which gave us our values of 26 kilometers of LRT track implemented and 415 vehicles, as well as uh, 717 buses uh, implemented. Um, so now in order for this to be viable for the population, uh, we made sure to design our public transit so that 90% of citizens would be within 300 meters of an LRT or bus stop. Um, and so this was in order to minimize uh, the barriers that would prevent somebody from taking public transit. Uh, and in order to reduce the amount of carbon emissions from the transportation sector, we also decided that um, all public transportation vehicles uh, and the majority of private vehicles would be electric vehicles by 2050. Um, and so since the energy mix in Reykjavik is fairly clean, as I'll talk about in a minute, um, this was uh, a fairly good option for us. Um, so we also wanted to increase the number of trips that were made by active transportation. Um, so as Sayla talked about in the land use section, um, densifying the urban areas of the city makes active transit a lot more viable when you have everything you need um, in a smaller area. And we also decided to implement more um, dedicated bicycle lanes. So these are outlined on the map here in green. Um, so you can see that these follow alongside some major roads, but uh, not the main uh, arteries. Um, and we also are going to implement 120 bicycle parking spaces around the city in order to promote this transportation method. Um, so now onto the energy mix. Uh, Reykjavik already has a very clean energy grid with the majority of its energy coming from geothermal and hydro energy sources. 
Um, so for our design, we wanted to get rid of the non-renewable energy sources altogether. So we proposed an energy mix of 25% hydro energy and 75% geothermal energy. Uh, so this chart also shows the total energy consumption and generation in Reykjavik. So you can see that they generate more electricity than they use, which accounts for the transmission and distribution losses throughout the city. Um, these maps show the locations of the power plants uh, throughout Iceland. So uh, in the picture on the far left, you can see uh, Reykjavik is the red dot in the, in the bottom left. Um, so there's four geothermal plants right around the city that uh, supply the majority of their energy sources. Um, in the middle here, uh, we have all the hydropower plants are around the country. And on the right, this is the electricity distribution network that connects all of these plants to the cities and down to Reykjavik. So this is the existing um, energy supply system. And uh, we decided that we were going to, um, uh, we were not going to implement any more power plants because these existing power plants should be able to support the energy demands of Reykjavik uh, in the future. So with regards to uh, water, Reykjavik has an abundant supply of fresh water because of its uh, immense groundwater reserves that will be productively recharged with an increased 15% uh, uh, precipitation rate uh, by 2050. So currently the total water demand is 0.84 megaliters per capita and 85% of that is hot water. 70% of water is lost, 17% of water is lost through uh, leaky pipes. So uh, the first objective that we want to do is we want to uh, provide 20% of uh, overall hot water needs by incorporating wastewater heat recovery drains in all households that transfer heat from outgoing uh, wastewater to incoming freshwater. Um, we also want to do 100% reduction in water loss through proactive leakage management in the distribution pipeline to achieve an annual water demand of 0.7 megaliters per capita. Um, with regards to stormwater, we expect an increase uh, of 20% in runoff because of the increase in precipitation. We want to harvest some rainwater to use for laundry, flushing, and garden use for all regular citizens. Um, this is around 70% of the total uh, water demand, so around 6,465 megaliters. And for that, we only need to harvest uh, rainwater from 7 kilometers squared of households. Um, and even though Reykjavik has an abundant supply of fresh water, we still want to harvest rainwater because we believe in the global sentiment that no matter how resourceful your city or country is, there's always room to improve with regards to sustainability. Um, with regards to waste, um, there's currently a privatized waste management company called Zorfa that is in charge of collecting household waste and managing uh, recycling centers. So the total waste produced in 2017 was around 80,587 tons. 70% of that was organic and 30% of that was inorganic. 50% of the waste was landfilled and 50% of the waste was uh, recycled. So we have a goal of decreasing landfill organic waste through educational community programs that um, teach communities to reduce their uh, food waste. Um, and we also want to implement anaerobic digestion plants to produce uh, biogas for heating, but we also want to convert some organic waste to methane fuel. So for our best case scenario, supposing we use all organic waste for methane fuel, we are able to estimate 300,000 trips. And we also, with regards to recycling, we're hoping to implement a new recycling center in our new community and also implement a reverse blending machine. Uh, so now moving on to greenhouse gas emissions for Reykjavik. Uh, so the four main sectors of emissions for the city are energy, industrial processes, agriculture, and waste. Um, so this table summarizes the per capita emissions for 2017, 2050 business as usual, and 2050 with our uh, proposed plan. So unfortunately in this design, we didn't address uh, industrial processes or agriculture at all. Um, so we weren't able to reduce the emissions from these two sectors. Uh, but we were able to reduce the energy uh, emissions by um, eliminating the use of oil and coal energy from the city's energy mix, as well as switching uh, all of the transportation to electric vehicles. And we were also able to reduce the energy use in buildings by implementing our improvements to building technology. And the reduction of, weight of uh, emissions in the waste sector came from reduction in solid waste disposal. So with all these changes implemented, we were found that we were able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 2.9 tons of CO2 per capita, or 20%. Um, so our goal was to reduce the emissions by 73%. Uh, so we were pretty far off, but this is mostly due to the limitations of the project and not being able to uh, reduce emissions from industrial or agriculture, which are two main contributors uh, for the emissions. So this is our urban metabolism for 2017 compared to our urban metabolism for 2050, where we have a bit more loops closed off with the energy going back, uh, energy production going back into the energy consumed and some of uh, the waste being converted into energy to be used um, for, uh, for the city. 
So in terms of the sustainable development goals, uh, our main focus was um, uh, the transportation, which targeted uh, target 11.2. Um, the land use, uh, the land use benefits um, address targets uh, 11.3 um, and 11.7, and our, our waste reduction uh, was able to address target 11.6. So even though we weren't able to uh, meet our greenhouse gas emissions goal um, due to the limitations of the project, we were able to meet our goals for each individual sector, um, so for the transportation and, and the building use. So as a result, we uh, found that our project was uh, successful for 2050. Thank you.